Hi, Max Brantley with the Arkansas Times on Monday, November 2nd. Slow day so far for us, but a lot of activity at the state capitol. Political filing began today, both for the party primaries and for the nonpartisan judicial elections, which will be held March 1st this year. Mike Huckabee was very first in line. He's not first in line currently in the polling for the Republican presidential nomination, but he was front and center this morning with uh, his wife, Janet, to be the first to register for the Arkansas ballot. He said he was proud to be on the ballot in his home state. He called it his home state. Of course, he has lived in Florida for four or five years now. Uh, other news today in filing, Connor Eldridge, a Democrat, did file to run for U.S. Senate against incumbent Republican John Bozeman. That seemed to be an uphill climb, but I think that's a race in which a lot of money will be spent by next November. The big action won't occur until fall, of course. And finally, one of the biggest questions remaining on the ballot is will any races develop for the two open seats on the Arkansas Supreme Court? So far, Courtney Goodson is unopposed <clears throat> as an announced candidate for Chief Justice, and Sean Womack, a, a judge from Mountain Home and a Republican of long standing, is unopposed for another seat on the Supreme Court. Will they get opposition? There are efforts underway still to find candidates to run against these two. They have a lot of opposition in the bar, but not yet anybody who will stand up and take them on in a race. On the Arkansas blog today, David Ramsey of the Arkansas Times staff has finally done some deep investigation to some figures that got some wide reporting in some news media about indications of potential fraud in the state Medicaid rolls. Well, it turns out that uh, those numbers were, as we suspected from the beginning, taken somewhat out of context. A basic data search showed maybe 40,000 people had out-of-state addresses at one time, checks of those addresses showing many of those people are in fact eligible for Medicaid and are residents of Arkansas. These data checks were used to fire up legislators, but uh, the reporting on them was uh, left a lot to be desired. There comes a point at which rooting out Medicaid fraud can become far more expensive than some of the small people who get Medicaid that aren't supposed to. Some of the biggest fraud is on the provider end of the spectrum. We also learned over the weekend, the Arkansas Times blog did, <clears throat> that the State Highway and Transportation Department had failed to get a $200 million federal so-called Tiger Grant it had sought to help pay for the big Interstate 30 project that's proposed in downtown, something that could cost $650 million. What will they do without the plan for $200 million? They're not ready to say yet, but they are going to have a public meeting with the City Board of Directors at 7 p.m. Tuesday night at the Clinton Presidential Center to talk about plans for the highway, which has become very controversial because of the imagined damage it'll do to areas downtown. Perhaps they'll talk about what they do without the $200 million. Interesting item uh, from Conduit for Action, which is a conservative political group that aims to elect political candidates like itself. It provided a scrap of information that it says it's learned that FBI and IRS agents have interviewed a uh, <clears throat> organization they're familiar with about money a legislator had uh, helped send to that organization from the state surplus funds. Well, this is not illegal to do this. The state surplus is divvied up by legislators and guided to local projects. It's perhaps in violation of the spirit, if not the letter, of the Arkansas Constitution, but it's not a crime, unless, of course, there were quid pro quos and money changed hands for this. It Perhaps it does give a little indication of where this widespread public corruption probe that the federal government has underway is heading into widespread activities of legislators. That could be why a lot of them are very nervous these days. We have no idea when or if this will turn into charges against anyone. Speaking of charges, Martha Schaffner, the former state treasurer, she was a Democrat, has <clears throat> been convicted of bribery for taking money from a security salesman. Today is the day she's supposed to report to a federal prison in, in Fort Worth and begin serving her 30-month sentence for that crime. And finally, another historical footnote. <clears throat> A death over the weekend of a, a man who had practiced law for a number of years in Little Rock named Daryl Brown. He was retired in Horatio, Arkansas, where he grew up. He's a little bit more than a footnote of history in Arkansas. He was the first black man to play football on the Razorback football team. He was a walk-on in 1965. He was treated brutally because the coaches didn't want him to be there. There were some players on the team who, who tried to make way for him. It was, a, it was a hard experience, and he was finally recognized many years later uh, for, for his activities as being a trailblazer on the Razorback sports program. Uh, lots of good thoughts about him over the weekend. He had an interesting life in both the law and, and beginning in sports. It's sort of amazing to think that 150 years after the end of the Civil War, it was only 50 years ago that they let a black man play football at the University of Arkansas. His name was Daryl Brown. I'm Max Brantley. I'll be back tomorrow. You feel it in your heart. The spirit of Little Rock. 
We've had that spirit since 1927, helping build our city by producing decades of leaders in the heart of our state. We are the heart of business and innovation, the heart of politics and government, the heart of arts and culture, and in our city beats the heart of a Trojan. UALR, we are Little Rock's team.